Good morning. It's the 28th day of September today and welcome to the Daily Post, our daily sharing of scriptures and ideas and thoughts to hopefully challenge and cheer you through the day. We begin with the scripture today from Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you're reading the Bible in a year today, you need to move on through Isaiah chapters 5 and 6 and Ephesians chapter 1. The thoughts for the day. We didn't write the plan. We're only expected to follow it without question. It's hard to determine where to draw the line between being nice and not hurting people's feelings and standing up for what you believe. The tragedy of life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal, it lies in not having a goal to reach. The motivational thought for today, it isn't what you have, or who you are, or where you are, or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It's what you think about. On this day in 1066, the Norman conquest of England was completed. Claiming his right to the English throne, William, the Duke of Normandy, began his invasion of England at Pevensey. In 1745, the British national anthem, God Save the King, was sung for the first time at Covent Garden in London. In 1924, the first around the world flight was completed on this day. On April the 6th, 1924, four teams of pilots from the United States Army Air Service set out from Seattle, Washington, in an attempt to circumnavigate the world, and they completed it on this day. In 1978, uh, on this day in the Vatican, John Paul I was found dead after only 33 days being elected as the Pope. In 1992, a Pakistani Airbus A300 crashed into the mountains at Kathmandu in Nepal and 167 people died. In, 19, sorry, in 2015, NASA scientists announced the discovery of flowing water on Mars. In 2018, a 7.5 magnitude earthquake hit just off the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia, setting off a tsunami that hit cities of Dongala and Palu, where at least 1,650 people were killed. The personal story of the day, straight, is right. When I was a young boy, the kids in my neighbourhood built a clubhouse. We were able to get the first floor level, but we were having trouble making the sideboards fit because we didn't use a plumb line. The finished product looked like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Carpenters often use a plumb line to make sure the walls are square with the floor. It's a string with a weight on it that hangs straight down to guide the builder when he puts up a wall. In Amos chapter 7, we read about another kind of plumb line. The Lord first told Amos about a swarm of locusts and a great fire, which were pictures of foretelling the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. After the prophet prayed and the Lord agreed to delay his judgment, Amos was given a vision of a straight wall. The Lord was standing by it with a plumb line. Because Israel's conduct didn't square with God's laws, they experienced God's wrath, as we can read in Amos chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. As saints and followers of Jesus Christ, we have a plumb line by which we can evaluate our lives. It is the Word of God, with its principles and commands. When faced with moral choices, we must see what the Scriptures teach. When we follow the Lord's directives, we need not fear 
what his plumb line will reveal about our lives. The devotional thoughts of the day, the first is entitled, The Wrong Standard. The scripture comes from Psalm 119, verse 163, and further references come from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. It's not unusual for some teachers to grade on a curve when they give an especially difficult exam. This practice adjusts the grading scale to the performance of the students rather than grading the students' performance based on an established scale. Of course, the fear of every student who is graded this way is that someone in the class will break the curve by answering most of the questions correctly. Some who misunderstand the Bible's principles of grace believe that God uses a similar approach when it comes to judging human behaviour. They're convinced that the only requirement in order to be declared righteous in God's sight is to do one's best. While they admit that they are not perfect, they take comfort in the knowledge that they are not as bad as some others. Jesus reveals the error of such thinking in the passage by pointing out that he had come to fulfill the law of the prophets rather than to abolish them, as we can read in verse 17. The terms law and prophets refer to the entire Old Testament. Jesus did not lower God's standard. He upheld it and warned that those who set it aside would be called least in the kingdom of heaven in verse 19. Ironically, the religious leaders of Christ's day wrongly believed that they were living by God's standard. They took pride in their own righteousness and viewed with contempt all those who fell short of that standard. In reality, they had modified God's law to fit their performance and have added their own traditions to it. One of Jesus' goals in this section of the Sermon on the Mount was to correct that standard to reflect God's scale. More importantly, he explained that he had come to fulfill God's law on our behalf so that all those who placed their faith in him could be declared righteous. Jesus did not change the standard. He met it and changed us so that our lives might reflect God's righteousness. Christ did not break the curve. He broke the curse, as we can read in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. The second thought is entitled, Rivers of Living Water, and the scripture from Acts chapter 2 and verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. When Peter quoted Joel's prophecy, the Spirit enabled him to preach with tremendous boldness. A distinctive sign of the final days was the ministry of the individual believer, that is, the general priesthood. God's Spirit would no longer operate solely through kings, priests and prophets, but as a result of the new covenant, believers would prophesy and have dreams and visions. Through the born-again experience, the Spirit of God comes and lives in us. Our body becomes God's temple, and our Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit communicates from within our hearts. The body can be compared to the outer courts of the temple. The soul is the holy place, and the heart, the Spirit, is the holy of holies. God's Spirit God's glory dwells there. Before the Spirit was given, Jesus explained that the rivers of living water would flow out of people's innermost being, which we can read in John chapter 7 and verses 37 to 39. With the outpouring of the Spirit, streams of living water flowed forth from every believer. God would lead his people, collectively and individually, 
by dwelling in them and working in and through them. This had never occurred before. The river of life, the life of the Spirit, would flow from heaven down into our hearts and then out to the whole world. It was something totally new. And wherever the stream flows, there is a restoration of life. One moment of humour for the day. A 95-year-old woman was living at a nursing home. She received a visit from one of her fellow church members. How are you feeling, Mary? The visitor asked. Oh, said Mary, I'm just worried sick. What are you so worried about, dear? Her friend asked. You look like you're in good health. Are they taking care of you here? Yeah, they are. Looking after me quite well. Are you in any pain, she asked? No, Mary said. I've never had a pain in all my life. Well, what are you worried about? Asked her friend. The old lady leaned back in her rocking chair and she slowly explained her major worry. She said, every close friend I ever had and everyone that I've known from the fellowship has already died and gone to heaven and I'm really afraid that they're wondering where I've gone. <laughs> the facts of the day. Human thigh bones are stronger than concrete. You were born with 300 bones. When you get to be an adult you only have 206. And I don't know where the others go. You can have to look it up for yourself. <laughs> the closing thought for today, Lord, today I will set aside petty grievances and look for solutions. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, we hope that uh, you found the Daily Post enjoyable and uh, valuable. And we look forward to your company again tomorrow morning. Have a blessed day. Bye for now.